Fantastic. Yes. Um, so uh, welcome everyone um, to this online uh, seminar. I'm super happy to be hosting. Um, the, uh, just to let everyone know that this presentation and discussion is being recorded uh, because you know some people aren't able to join so and they'll be able to watch it later so that means that if you speak up you're going to be recorded so we're assuming that you're consenting to the recording uh, uh, by speaking up if you want to ask questions can you use the chat function uh, and you can either send them privately to Esther Forgan um, who's collating them or you can send it uh, not privately, and then everyone can see your question if, if you'd prefer that to happen. Okay, so with that housekeeping out of the way, uh, it's great to introduce Tara Slough, who is a member of the Natural Resource Governance Metacata Steering Committee, and also a fellow of the University of California, Berkeley. So she has done a lot of work on, on uh, governance and institutions and development, um, including field work in Nigeria, Malawi, uh, Argentina, Argentina, Colombia, Haiti, Peru, and Venezuela. That's quite a collection of countries. Um, and then, so she'll be doing the main presentation, and then um, Saria Sami is going to uh, join us for the discussion. He is the executive director of EGAP, which is a network of political scientists working on governance and institutions. Um, and uh, and EGAP has, has partnered with DFID's evaluation unit over a number of years to try and do what they call these metacata analysis, which is where they try and test the same intervention in a number of different locations to try and get a kind of external, uh, um, uh, uh, the, sorry, not externality, um, the um, external validity questions and uh, see whether, the, the, whether they can say something systematic about whether there's different impacts in different kinds of countries. So without further ado, I will hand over to Tara uh, to present this, this result. I understand, by the way, there was one on taxes, a Metacatra seminar on taxes earlier um, in the day. So I'm, uh, I missed that one, but I'm looking forward to seeing this one. Uh, take it away, Tara. Great. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, it's an honor to present to you, um, and I look forward to hearing your thoughts on this work that was um, generously supported by DFID. So, so today I want to um, give just a slight overview about um, what EGAP is and sort of the intent of the Medicata Initiative and how perhaps this is uh, can inform um, evidence-based policy and how we think about um, uh, implementing policies, uh, similar policies in very different places. Um, I'll go on to talk about the policy problem that we're trying to address with this Medicata and the community monitoring intervention that we're gonna study. Um, I will then tell you a little bit about the six projects that comprise the Medicata, so the six uh, studies in which we harmonized um, community monitoring, and then tell you about um, our findings, the policy implications, and then I look forward to your questions. So um, EGAP is a cross-disciplinary network of researchers and practitioners um, that are united in their um, uh, approach to thinking about policy relevant research foc uh, focused on the use of field experiments. Um, and I think one of the important pieces of EGAP is sort of this idea of forging partnerships between researchers and pr uh, policy practitioners, um, be they governments or NGOs, um, and uh, to use the work um, developed through these partnerships to inform um, policy making, largely on topics of development, but um, there's also a much broader portfolio. Okay. Um, so the, as Rachel alluded to, the Medicata Initiative is um, a model of collaborative research, uh, which seeks to look at evaluate common interventions in multiple sites um, using field experiments. So to date, um, there have been uh, 
four medicatas that have been um, more or less completed or come out of the field, um, and then a fifth one that's just going into the field. So if you look at the map here, uh, the orange countries are those in which um, at least one medicata project has been um, implemented across those five rounds. So um, as just a bit of uh, background, which many of you may be familiar with already, um, we're going to be using field experiments in this. And so an experiment is a, is a research design in which uh, researchers or um, implementers are manipulating one variable or one treatment, uh, holding all others constant. Um, and so that uh, the difference between those uh, communities in this case assigned to treatment and those not assigned to treatment allow us to look at um, the causal effect of a program here, community monitoring um, on some outcomes of interest. Um, and so as such, experiments are nice because they are one of the best ways to establish um, causality. So to think about what are the actual impacts of the intervention. One of the cr uh, criticisms of experimental research generally um, is that you may be able to find uh, a causal effect in one site, but it doesn't tell us very much about what would happen if we put the experiment even in a similar or even very different site. Um, and so the six studies we're gonna look at here are gonna try to help us determine whether the effects um, that we observe are consistent across different contexts. And we'll look at, um, in this natural resource medicata, some very different contexts, different resource systems, different forms of governance. Um, and so the ideal of this is to try to contribute towards, to um, a movement, an increasing movement uh, towards uh, evidence-based policy. So uh, to develop public policy, um, and learn from um, systematic uh, evidence. Uh, and I think the contribution of the Medicata initiative in this way is largely the um, evaluation of a similar protocol across many sites. Um, and so when we think about whether a program is able to generate uh, consistent effects across places or not, I think that this is very helpful um, for Hopefully, if I'm not too presumptuous, an organization like DFID, which aims to um, promote certain types of policies, potentially across quite different contexts. And so our hope is that the um, implementation of these projects across sites provides uh, some new evidence and some new guidance uh, to organizations trying to deploy new policies. I want to think about the uh, natural resource governance policy program and the intervention uh, that was implemented across these six sites. And so the policy problem um, that we focus on is sort of the miss or overuse of natural, re uh, natural resources. And these programs are certainly not limited to developing settings, um, but we think that they can be particularly acute. So um, particularly in places that will be um, more impacted or disproportionately impacted by climate change um, and that experience sort of strong pressures from businesses that can benefit from extraction, potentially at the expense of communities. And so we're going to focus on different resource systems in this. I think in some, some of these resources, uh, these problems have been better quantified than others. So we can think about, um, for example, some of our studies look at forests and deforestation and the magnitude of the pro uh, problem globally is quite large. So in 2018, uh, the area, um, at least that um, was remote sense to be deforested in the world was equivalent to the sort of territory of the country of Belgium. And so we'll look at other resources as well that are sort of perhaps less systematically studied. But I think these are really central problems to uh, communities that we study, um, as well as communities across um, the global south and the globe more broadly. Okay. So we focus on this idea of natural resource governance. Um, and so the effective um, governance of common resources is quite difficult. Um, and there are certainly top-down approaches to this problem. Um, so uh, in, researchers have advocated uh, different forms of privatization um, or strict regulation. Um, yet, so these are in principle um, 
potentially more difficult to enact in certain settings than others. Um, it requires an, a degree of both will and capacity to enforce regulations, and there's some resources that um, are more difficult to privatize than others. And so in light of this, we also th see continued over and misuse of resources um, uh, across the globe. And so what we want to think about is a more bottom-up approach to natural resource governance. And so we're going to focus on community monitoring. And so community monitoring is a bottom-up approach where communities observe, record, and disseminate information about uh, patterns of resource use, misuse, or depletion. So sort of the modal intervention of this is the training of monitors, so people with uh, some skills to assess the state of resources. Um, those people go out, uh, observe the resources at some periodic interval, and then they come back to their communities and they share the information with the community through a new forum or some pre-existing uh, forum for information dissemination. I think in this way, we can also think about this as sort of um, democratizing um, or making uh, information about uh, natural resources more widely available to communities. And so community monitoring um, has long been recognized um, as a feature or institution that promotes um, successful resource management. And I think it's clear why we might expect this to be sort of reducing um, uh, information asymmetries, promoting learning about resources, but it's not been systematically tested. And so um, one issue here is that when we observe communities that are very successful at protecting, for example, their forests, their groundwater, um, they may be engaged in community monitoring, but it's very hard to learn whether this is an approach that can be um, implemented more widely to communities that are not already managing their resources in a sustainable fashion just by observation of successful cases. And so what we want to do here is we want to think about how uh, we can create these programs. First, can they be created? Can people be induced to monitor? And then how do communities respond um, to uh, this intervention? Okay. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about the six projects that comprise this. So each of these studies was done um, by a different team. And so the projects developed um, through um, sort of uh, gauging of researcher interest. So ultimately there was a RFP to which 22 teams propo uh, proposed some type of community monitoring um, study. And so the steering committee uh, selected six studies that were the most um, promising or and that could be sort of uh, harmonized together. Um, in 2017, the six selected teams met twice to harmonize interventions and outcome measures. Um, and then the teams worked with local partners to develop and evaluate these community monitoring schemes. And then what I'll show you today is how we bring the evidence back together on the back end of this. So the six sites that were selected, um, which I'll tell you um, a little bit more in detail about each project, were Costa Rica, Peru, Brazil, Liberia, Uganda, and China. Um, and so the way that this was organized um, was that there's a steering committee that was ultimately sort of two people who tried to oversee and coordinate across the teams. Um, I was one of the members of the steering committee, um, and that's why I'm presenting to you today. And then the research teams, um, there were six teams that had 17 um, individual researchers on them. I was also part of the uh, Peru project um, on the research team. And so what we're trying to learn, we're trying to answer um, sort of one big question with this project, and that's simply, does natural resource governance improve when communities monitor resource use? So community monitoring consists of a number of different components of the treatment. Um, we uh, introduced monitoring to communities where monitoring was um, at best infrequent or not practiced by the community uh, before. 
There was then a training of monitors to learn how to uh, practice elements of citizen science, right? Uh, so to learn about how to measure these things, um, how to record them, uh, and what different measures meant. Uh, then the monitors embarked upon sort of a, a year-long um, period of monitoring of the resources. Um, and then disseminated their findings in different ways um, in sort of locally relevant fashion to their communities. Um, we were gonna think about uh, four different outcomes that we measure across sites. So we look at um, resource use, so objective measures of um, the status of resources. Um, and then we're gonna look at three survey-based outcomes to try to examine the governance um, piece of this. So we're gonna look at the satisfaction of community members with the management of natural resources, uh, citizen knowledge of resource use um, and abuses thereof, and then citizen sense of stewardship. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about what goes into each of these outcomes when I present the results. So we have um, six different projects um, and they, they focus on three different resource systems, so to speak. Um, and so in China, we look at monitoring of pollution in surface water, so waterways. Um, in Brazil and Costa Rica, we're looking at um, both the quantity and then in Costa Rica also the quality of groundwater use. In Liberia, Peru, and Uganda, we're going to be focused on um, different uh, types of monitoring of uh, forest stocks or deforestation. Okay. So I want to tell you just a, very briefly about each of the six projects. So each of the six projects um, ran for at least a year. Um, and there's some more information about uh, the treatments in each place on these slides. But I'll tell you um, more briefly that sort of the Brazilian project aims to promote uh, sustainable groundwater use uh, through monitoring of water levels and consumption, so electricity usage by wells. And they're working in the semi-arid state of Ceará, which is in the northeast of Brazil. Um, and I think one interesting feature of this context is that Seara is known sort of in the past decade for sort of record levels of drought, but is also a site of a lot of policy intervention um, by the state government and other actors towards alleviating the effects of this. So this is a study looking at uh, how in such uh, community groundwater can be more sustainably managed. Um, so in China, unlike the other projects, um, they're examining the uh, monitoring of surface water quality. So they're monitoring pollution levels in urban communities. And so the sort of urban piece of this is the piece that sort of sets China apart from much of the literature on community mo um, management of resources. Um, and so they're focused in the province of Jiangsu. Um, and one thing I think should be noted is that the communities here, because we're working in an urban environment, are more like micro neighborhoods and perhaps less cohesive than in the rural environments and the rest of the thing in the rest of the studies. Um, monitors in these sites, as you can see in the picture, uh, conducted um, both uh, visual and sort of smell tests of the water, in addition to collecting samples that could be um, analyzed. Um, uh, for measures of pollution, okay. Um, the Costa Rican project was sought, to, much like the Brazil team, to improve water access usage and also quality in arid regions across Costa Rica. Um, and so to facilitate um, sort of a management body's ability to respond to the information generated, in addition to sending information to uh, local communities, they also developed an app uh, to facilitate transmission of information from weekly monitoring back to these um, community-based um, utility boards, effectively, um, that are responsible for maintaining um, and pricing uh, billing of groundwater in this context. 
The final three studies are all focused on forests. So the Liberian project examined forest management in um, Bong County, uh, looking at communities that have both forests and active um, chainsaw milling activities. Um, monitors engaged in quarterly forest uh, monitoring walks and then created a series of new meetings to disseminate their findings to the community. Um, in Peru, we worked with a network of indigenous federations to create monitoring programs in indigenous communities in uh, the Peruvian Amazon. And so one of the sort of the unique feature of this program, I think, um, was that we sought to um, bring remote sensed alerts to communities. So governments and NGOs have invested a lot in sort of flying satellites over to detect where deforestation is happening, both in the Amazon and in many other regions. But one of the issues is these don't make it in a timely fashion to the sort of communities that are both the first responders and the most impacted. And so this developed an app that at least monthly would update any new early alerts of deforestation, which sought to make a sort of the on the ground monitoring walks more efficient. Um, finally, in Uganda, um, they conducted a study in communities that were proximate to um, central forest reserves across the country, um, training monitors to take uh, monthly walks to measure both deforestation, but also uh, more granular measures of forest quality on demarcated plots that were proximate to the community. Okay. So, I want to think first about the question of whether we were able to induce people to monitor, uh, community members to monitor in communities where this really hadn't existed before. Because I think for the, both the interpretation of the later results and thinking about this as a policy program, this is sort of an outcome of interest. So can we get people to engage in these behaviors? And so in five sites, we see um, high and pretty sustained levels of uh, par community participation and community monitoring. So in these five sites, um, all the sites except for Brazil, we see that in general about um, over 80% of communities are monitoring, um, are engaging in monitoring activities in every quarter. And so we're reducing this to the quarter since that was the sort of least frequent temporal unit across sites, um, but we can analyze some of these sites in much greater detail. Um, in Brazil, very few communities participated in monitoring, and we also saw that the participation waned over time. And so we think that there's several reasons that this may have happened. Um, first, uh, there was sort of a much lighter touch training and less contact with communities over time. There were also technical challenges. So they developed a novel uh, well measurement, uh, groundwater um, level measurement device that could be produced at low cost and used in communities. And one of the problems was that the um, lids or tops of wells in many communities could not be removed um, based on the way they were constructed. So it was much harder to actually monitor. So we don't actually know why that is. Um, but we think that there's sort of two main takeaways from this. First, that it's possible, at least with the support of an outside organization, to get uh, communities to monitor, um, but that it may take uh, sufficient uh, effort and contact to follow up with communities to make sure that they're able to do the monitoring um, and engaged in this way. We see this dip in Liberia. Um, there was contact lost in this third quarter, and so no record of intervention, which also speaks to sort of the importance of this um, support from a partner organization. Okay, so now we're going to look at sort of the ultimate outcomes of interest, sort of the causal effects um, of uh, community monitoring on these uh, four main outcomes of interest. And so for all of these measures, what we want to do is we're just um, estimating a pretty simple qual uh, quantity. We're sort of comparing average levels in treatment communities to those in control communities, right? Remember, this is um, the way that we allocated the monitoring treatment. Um, one of the issues that comes up in this study, um, and in many studies across contexts, but particularly here, um, is that the outcome measures themselves, particularly with regard to resource use, 
are quite different across sites, right? We're comparing sort of kilowatt hours measuring usage uh, um, or consumption of water in wells in, for example, Costa Rica and Brazil um, to area deforested in Liberia and Peru, right? And these don't have sort of natural um, comparability in sort of the raw measures. And so what we're going to do is we're going to um, create a normalization. Um, we're going to orient all the variables in the same direction uh, across sites. And then what we're going to do is we're going to measure using um, this index, these indices, which are effectively um, standardized to the site. So they're measures of uh, the relative um, the uh, relative resource use, for example, in um, Brazil and Liberia, right? Um, and so that's the thing that we're going to look at, these standardized effects. And then also because the survey outcomes have multiple components that go into them, which I'll show you in a second, we're also going to use these indices there to look at these relative differences between treatment and control communities, okay? Um, and so uh, what we're doing um, in terms of resource use is um, uh, we are gonna standardize uh, some objective indicators of um, uh, the, the resource uh, quality or quantity across sites. We also are gonna look at the three survey outcomes. Um, so we're gonna look at first citizen satisfaction. So these are measures of community members satisfaction with the resource, its management and the behavior of other citizens in the communities towards the resource. Um, then we're also gonna look at how knowledge of, res of the resource or resource use changes. Um, so we have sort of five component measures. Um, so sort of objective knowledge of the resource status, access to knowledge, salience of resource use, um, certainty, uh, and knowledge of the causes of overuse or degradation of the resource. And then we're gonna look at a sense of stewardship. So here we're thinking about sort of, uh, this is perhaps the most abstract outcome. We're thinking about norms of, about resource use and then um, community member willingness to pay or to participate in monitoring activities, okay? So looking at our first outcome, which is the outcome about resource use, um, we find that community monitoring reduces this is resource use or degradation across sites. So I'm going to show you a set of plots that are quite similar. So these are the intent to treat effects, so the average difference between treatment and control on the standardized outcome across the six sites, right? Um, and then we'll look at the um, outcomes that we get from a meta-analysis. So we're looking at the average intent to treat effects across sites. And we're gonna look at two different estimates. First, we're gonna look at uh, the effect in all the sites. And then we're gonna look at the effect in all the sites except for Brazil. Recall that Brazil was not able to get people to sort of uh, participate in monitoring in the same way. And so we're gonna present the two quantities um, separately. So one thing that we see when we look at this graph is that the estimates in the individual studies are quite noisy. We have uh, sort of wide confidence intervals. And by pooling, so by looking across the sites, we're able, our precision improves. Um, one other finding on this, which I think is interesting, and I'll talk more about in the policy implications, is that the treatment effects across sites are larger where the resource problem was most severe. Right, so in places that had more deforestation, um, that's where we saw the biggest reductions in the amount of area deforested, for example. Um, and this is gonna have implications for how we think about the, how we could sort of efficiently implement monitoring at, um, in new communities. Um, the second outcome we're gonna look at is user satisfaction. Um, and so what we find here is that community monitoring um, increases citizen satisfaction with the natural resource. And so the index here that we're thinking about includes three measures. It's uh, the citizen satisfaction with the resource status itself, citizen satisfaction with resource management, and citizen satisfaction with other citizens' behaviors. Um, what we find here is that um, the effect is sort of 
uh, small and much more noisy with Brazil. Um, we see sort of a moderate sized effect um, without Brazil um, that is much more precise. Um, interestingly, when we decompose the components of this index, we see very similar effects on citizen satisfaction and um, with the resource and its management, but very little movement in terms of citizen satisfaction um, with other citizens' behavior. Um, in the third outcome, we want to look at knowledge among uh, community members. Um, about the natural resource. And so um, monitoring uh, increases citizen knowledge about their community's resources. Um, and we find that this is true uh, across sites um, and uh, with sort of a moderate uh, effect size, but we do find um, increases in this, knowledge, if, in this knowledge index. And we see sort of relatively consistent but noisier um, increases across the components of the index. Um, both in terms of objective knowledge of resource uh, status, understanding the causes of why uh, resources are overused or degraded, um, access to knowledge, uh, certainty about beliefs about the resource, um, and then the salience of resource issues. So um, the extent to which people uh, state something um, about this common pool resource when asked what the major threats to the community are. Um, finally, uh, we have more uh, different findings on stewardship. So in contrast to the other sites where we find no evidence of sort of heterogeneity and outcomes across sites, uh, um, we, in, with stewardship, we find uh, very different outcomes um, in different places, right? We find that there's no evidence that monitoring increases community member stewardship behaviors on average, so in any site or in Brazil. Um, and so if you'll recall, this index uh, includes measures of norms and willingness to participate in resource management. Um, and so some of these things, so one thing that I think we should take in mind from these is sort of stepping away from the causal effect, if we just want to describe these across sites, um, the norms against um, polluting in China, overusing water in Brazil and Costa Rica, or sort of deforesting in any regard in the forest sites are extremely strong. So it's very hard to sort of increase uh, these outcomes within these communities. Um, so we think about what proportion of citizens agree with these statements about norms and they range from like 82 percent to 99 percent. So we don't see very much movement, uh, as much movement on that outcome and in some sense it would be really hard to increase that. Um, in terms of willingness to participate there's um, sort of different ways, that we see sort of more differences there. Um, in Peru the outcome went in the opposite direction of what we expected. In Liberia we see an increase. And so one of the reasons that we think this may be the case is that there's sort of um, variation in how resources were managed or even community attention to these uh, before the intervention. Um, and so for example um, in Peru uh, one of the reasons that monitoring didn't happen as this was uh, expected to be a collective activity, um, though there were sort of well-documented evidence of collective action problems in this regard. And so moving to monitor sort of assigned this task to one person and sort of other people compensated by being less willing to participate. And we only see this in terms of sort of community, uh, like participation in patrols, not in other forms of collective action. Um, in Liberia, this seemed to mobilize people who were sort of less willing to participate ex ante. Okay, so I want to think about what the lessons we can learn from this intervention are. Um, and so I think the first clear uh, policy implication is that um, it can be sort of, it's can be productive to invest in community monitoring. And so I think that there's a number of reasons why this, uh, what, that we can take, make this inference. So first we observe widespread outcome uh, of uptake of community monitoring across context. And this seems to yield uh, 
very little heterogeneity uh, across sites. So these places that are very different in both their resources and, um, and the sort of governing context. And this yields less resource consumption and seemingly more empowered communities, both in terms of knowledge and satisfaction, right? So I think one lesson to take away from what we observe in Brazil is that creating and sustaining monitoring from the outside can be costly um, and seems to require some sustained support at least uh, to get it going. Um, and so I think that's one thing we learn from this difference between Brazil and the other sites. One other thing is that the effect sizes that we show are sort of moderate. Um, and so to the extent that the literature on um, community sort of community management of common pool resources suggests that there's many factors that are important. Uh, in future iterations, it may be useful following this literature to bundle this community monitoring with other types of interventions suggested by the literature. Okay. Um, the second policy implication, I think, is to the extent that we are investing in community monitoring, there are ways to target it, uh, these programs that seem to increase the conservation impacts per pound or dollar invested, right? So if you remember, we found larger reductions in resource use in the most affected communities, so the places where deforestation rates are highest. And this suggests that potentially targeting the communities where ex ante, we know that there's more deforestation or worse uh, resource outcomes can produce greater gains. And so one implication that comes from one site, Uganda, is that we need to be aware of or plan for the possibility of displacement when designing these programs. So in Uganda, they mark the plots that are being monitored uh, quite distinctly, uh, but then um, find suggested evidence that this forced people who were cutting down the forest uh, to move sort of just outside those plots. And so I think this provides implications for how we think about first how we define the area as being monitored um, and how we could locate for which we have less support empirically, um, but I think is was an important feedback from a number of the partners is that uh, sustaining community monitoring over time may lead to larger gains. So if you'll recall, all of our studies ran for about a year. So this is the evidence that you see after the first year. Um, and so some implementers think that uh, these impacts should increase over time as uh, communities get more accustomed to this as the people who do, uh, as sort of people who deforest potentially from the outside learn that communities are empowered in this way. Um, and so, so and to the extent that we can look at more fine grained over time measurements, um, there is some evidence, uh, especially from Peru, that suggests that um, the level of monitoring, so the intensity of monitoring and its impacts may increase over time. So if we look at just the proportion of sort of reports or monitoring activity per month in Peru, um, we see that from the first month through the 13th month, um, we see that the rate of submission of these doubles over that time period, uh, right? And so communities are either, uh, monitors are investing more in monitoring or doing it more efficiently. And so this suggests that potentially sustaining the program uh, could lead to larger impacts. And so the experimental design in Peru has been preserved and continues and we'll be able to, in at least that site, to continue to measure um, two, three years down the road. Um, finally, I think one of the big uh, que sort of questions that this raises is sort of, who should be the primary targets of monitoring dissemination? Um, and we could think about communities themselves or management authorities. Sometimes when communities are the ones overseeing the forest, those are one and the same, but particularly for the water interventions, um, those are not necessarily the same bodies. Um, and so we can think about this in the Chinese case. So there was the treatment arm that we measure is that the monitors went out and then they disseminated the information to the communities on sort of like flyers or poster boards in, in the community. And then the alternative treatment arm uh, disseminated this information to local governments who are in principle 
um, in tasked with overseeing um, water quality and pollution reductions. And so they find an effect that when they, uh, a much stronger effect of, uh, at least on resource use, of submitting these reports to the local governments, right? Which suggests that potentially there are gains to be made by sort of putting this information in the hands of uh, people with more uh, authority to actually enact changes. Um, at the same time, uh, in Costa Rica, we see that authorities may not, so these local water boards may not have incentives to respond to this information. So we need to think a little bit more about what the problems and sort of responsiveness within these bodies are to understand who the right targets of this information are, the users or the management communities. Um, but I do think that one takeaway is that democratizing resource management, so reducing information asymmetries between leaders and citizens, and just sort of providing citizens fora to discuss these issues, um, is can be a really important goal of community monitoring. Um, that can uh, that may be in, um, that may push back against this sort of idea that it may be more efficient to uh, get this information to people who have uh, power to decide um, sort of outside bodies. And so I think that this is um, sort of in fertile place for uh, further sort of development of these programs. Thinking about you know what are the trade offs between focusing dissemination on sort of management authorities versus the communities as a whole. Um, and so ultimately, I think that we, uh, there's four main take, if I can sort of leave you with four main takeaways, they would be that uh, first, that it's possible to get people to go out and do this sort of bottom up monitoring. And this is, um, in some sense, exciting given that a lot of our bottom-up interventions in other sectors and domains have sort of taken this outside of the hands of communities and provided them with sort of outside monitoring information. So it seems like we can induce um, and incentivize community members to go out and do this, which is good. Um, we find um, that across contexts, community monitoring reduces resource use and increases both satisfaction and of with and knowledge of um, local common pool resources. Um, and to the extent that these effects are similar quantitatively across sites uh, suggests that monitoring programs can be effective in really different contexts with different resource systems, etc. Um, and so I think that from a policy perspective, this suggests that uh, investing in this type of community monitoring can be productive, uh, but there's ways to refine these interventions, both to increase the effects and to target them uh, more efficiently uh, that, 